Well, good evening, church. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday as we have been looking at the book of Philippians a little bit here. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to finish that up tonight, and then we'll continue to look at a few more things in Philippians before we move on uh, to our next Wednesday study. Uh, with that in mind, again, we want to thank you for joining us. encourage you to share these videos with anybody around you think might enjoy it or might need it. Uh, let them know that they're there, and, and just feel free to share these things out there. There's no uh, no problem with that. Uh, you're welcome to share them on your own pages and, and share that out with anybody you feel uh, so led to. Uh, we, in fact, we encourage that. So as we look today at Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12, we begin to think about what we have done these past couple of weeks. And Philippians, to this point, has really been a book uh, that sort of talked to us about what we need to do as Christ followers. What do we uh, need to do? And, and really, the answer to that has been given as be like Jesus. And if we're truthfully honest with ourselves as Christ followers today, that's still the same answer. What do we need to do to make the world better? Well, we need to be like Jesus and share him with anyone we can. Uh, we've said, I've said from the beginning of this, that the, the way when the world gets better, if we want this world to get better, then we share Christ with people because he is the only good in the world. That there is nothing else that measures up to good like he does. That he is the one holy good. And if people would become more like him and less like the world, well, then the world would become a better place. Because if we were more about seeking and serving Jesus than seeking and serving ourselves, then things would change. And so that's what we've talked about some of these last few weeks. That's what my prayer has been recently for our country, for our world, that those who don't know Jesus would come to know Jesus. That that would be the change we would see happen. That these things that we call problems, would no longer be problems if folks would come to know the Lord. And if we would see each other as Christ sees us, it would change things. So we get to this part of Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, and it says this. It says, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you, both to will and to act for his good purpose. And so we see there, what is it? Well, it's God working within us as Christ followers, enabling us to do what? To work and act, to will and act for what? For his good purpose. That anything we would do, we would do in service to the Lord, and we would do it in such a way because he is the one working within us. That everything that we do as Christ followers would point people towards Jesus. That our actions in society would point people towards Jesus. The way we treat people at a restaurant or at the grocery store or anywhere would point people towards Jesus. The way we act inside of our jobs, inside of our relationships with our friends and our family, that we would do those with the idea of being Christ-like in them. And I know that's hard, right? Because he's perfect. We are not. But we're told to do what we can to act for his good purpose. To act for the good purpose of God. Well, how does that work going forward? Well, it gives us some instruction here, starting with verse 14. says this, Do everything without grumbling and arguing. I don't know about you, church, but that's hard sometimes, right? I'm tired some days. Coffee doesn't work as well, or just was a long night the night before, or just a lot of stuff going on in the world. And it's easy sometimes to grumble and complain and argue, and it just comes easy to us in our humanity. But we're told here to do everything without grumbling and arguing. And I don't know about you, church, but on those days where I have those, those sort of grumble, grime moments, the day doesn't go as easy. It just everything's a chore. Everything's a, a drag. It, it's pulling at me to just be productive. And it's, I don't like those days. They're a struggle. Yet the days that I get up and I get after it and I realize what I'm doing and I get after it with a purpose behind it and I don't grumble, but I just know and I'm, I'm kind of excited to do the work. Those days go so much easier. Well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is where's my mind at in those days? The days when I wake up and I'm solely focused on myself, when I'm only thinking about me, those are the days that I grumble and complain because when I'm only thinking about me, all I'm thinking of is, 
well, this is such an inconvenience, or, oh, I have to do this again, or it's this, or it's that, because it's all about me. But on the days that I wake up realizing that it is not about me, but it is about Christ, it's about God, and serving those that he is allowing me to serve, those are the days where I wake up and go, this is exciting. This is exciting. Because I get to work and serve. God's given me a purpose to do something. And it's exciting. And it makes me think about with my children. There are days where I'm working on a project and they want to help. And there's a difference, right? Because all of you sort of understand what it means when a little one wants to help. It's not the best help in the world all the time, but it's the sweetest help with my two daughters. But I can tell the difference in, as a parent when... I actively engage and find something for them to do that matters compared to when I just sort of give them the task that blows them off and makes, you know, makes it look like I'm trying to get them to help. But really, I'm just trying to get them to not be a distraction. But when I give them a project that really matters and they know that it matters, their faces light up differently. They work a little bit harder. They want to make sure the work gets done right. I think in the same way with us as Christ followers, it's that same thing that he doesn't give us projects to blow us off or to put us to the back burner as we would as, an, as a human. But obviously God sees the difference when he calls us to something and, and we get excited about it comparative to when he calls us to something and we go, oh, not that, please not that, something else. And my wife and I have talked about this before and the understanding of you know, are there certain things in ministry that I wouldn't be comfortable with or, or you know, would be worried about? And obviously there are in my life. But I have to catch myself. Because even in those moments, if God calls me to do something that's uncomfortable, then I should rejoice in that uncomfortable moment because He will give me the strength to sustain through it. So that, and in that thought so much that I would pray for the uncomfortable moments so that I could have his strength to sustain me through it. Oh, that we would pray for uncomfortable. Sam would tell me you know, when he was, when we were still meeting in person, he would tell me all the time, he said, pray that something that's not in the bulletin would happen. And how true a statement that is. Oh, that we would pray for the unforeseen so that God would be present and that we would sustain ourselves through his energy. And that we would do these things without grumbling or arguing. Into 15, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. So the idea that we would do everything to act according to God's purpose, to God's will, do it without grumbling and arguing, well, what does that lead to? Well, that leads to us as a people group being viewed differently by the world so that we would be considered blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. That the world in its infinite fallity would still see you as a Christ follower, as someone who's trustworthy and worthwhile. The idea being that the world would see that there is something different about us inside of our relationship with Christ. And when they see that thing that's different, then it gives us the opportunity to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I fully admit, church, there have been multiple times in my life where I have not been good at this. When I was in college, early in my college career, I struggled with this greatly because I went to a, a junior college, I was involved in the athletic scene, and it was not the easiest place to be. It would have been easy to conform to the lifestyle of the stereotypical college student. But I chose not to do that. And the only reason I can say that I didn't give in to that was because God protected me from it. It would have been easy to conform to the stereotypical lifestyle of a college student living in a dorm with the things that were readily available to a college student living in a dorm. Yet there are moments now that I can look back on that God protected me from it. And I would love to tell you that I used 
that time to be an example and a light to the people that lived around me. And in moments I did, but for the most part, I struggled. Thankfully, I didn't give in to the, the lifestyle sins of a college student, but I wasn't as strong in my faith as I should have been. I didn't share the gospel with those around me like I should have. I became very much about myself. And it's not something I'm proud to admit. It's not something I'm proud to, to hearken back to, but it's the truth. The truth is, I didn't do the things that I was supposed to do when I started my college career. I didn't reach out like I needed to reach out. And yes, there were some great moments and there were some things that, that I was able to be a part of, that God allowed me to be a part of, that, that kept me moving. But it wasn't what it could have been. It wasn't what it could have been had I jumped in with both feet and done what he had called me to do from the beginning. And it's something I think about still to this day, church, that when presented with the opportunity that you know is from God, that you would not hesitate. That you would jump. That I would jump. That I would live as verse 15 tells me to live. To be blameless and pure. Shine like stars in the world that we would shine differently to the world around us and that we would be able to be the shining example of Christ-like love that we're supposed to be so that we could tell others about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Because that's what happens when we live like this. When we live like this and the world sees us different, the world sees us act and respond to things differently, it allows us an opportunity to share the gospel with people that we may have never been able to share the gospel with. It gives us an opportunity to share the gospel with people who will look at us and say, there's something different. There's something just a little bit different that I don't get. You're able to weather this a little differently than us, and I don't understand. And then we can come along and say, well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. I have a relationship with a man named Jesus Christ. And he allows me such peace in moments that I can't describe what it feels like sometimes. And so then we see in 16, it says, hold firmly the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or label, labor for nothing. So what he's talking about here, uh, the writer is talking about the idea that those people in Philippi, the Philippians that he's writing to, would hold firm to the message of life so that he could boast that he didn't run in vain or labor for nothing. What he doesn't want them to do is live their life based on him. He wants them to live their life based on Jesus. And it's the same cry I have as a pastor today. I don't want the church to be built upon me as a person. I don't want our church to be built upon any one humanistic personality. Our church needs to be built upon the foundation that is Jesus Christ so that it sustains itself over generations of time. So that when a person is moved out of a ministry in our church, there are others who move into that position to further the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not the ministry or the message of Trinity Baptist Church, but the message of Jesus Christ. So that it would just take root and flourish and run through this community throughout the world. Because when a church becomes about building itself, building its name, building its building. It misses the idea of building believers. And I'm all for church growth when we're building believers, strengthening believers. And I think the best way to do that is to be built around the foundation of Jesus Christ and not around some singular person. People, we come and go. Paul here, he's writing, telling the same thing. People come and go, but hold firm the message of life. Hold firm the message of Jesus Christ. And if any church holds firm to that, then it doesn't matter what people come into a position at that church because the root is Jesus Christ. And God will send the right people to further that, to move it down the road even farther. And those that come before leave out understanding that their labor was not in vain. Church, one of the things I love about being in ministry is being able to see the long-lasting impacts that Christ has had on people that I've been around. I look forward to seeing what God's going to do through our church 
in the future. As long as we stay out of the way and let him move and work like only he can, amazing things will happen. I don't want us to look back and wish of what might have been. I hope that we will look into the future and say, this is amazing because we sought to serve him. 17 says this, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also rejoice and share your joy with me. So what's he say there? Well, he's saying that even if the worst comes, I'm good. All right, for any of us as Christ followers, that's, that's the thing. We don't fear death because even if it comes, even if the worst comes for us, well, what does death do? Death begins our eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. That is celebratory, not sad. And in 18, we see there at the end, in the same way, you should also rejoice and share your joy with me. Church, that's what we talk about all the time. If you're struggling, we're struggling. If good is happening, let us know so we can rejoice in the good together. So often as a church, as a people group, not just Trinity, but as a Christian people group, we let one another know when we're suffering, but we don't want to talk about the good things because we're afraid we'll sound like we're bragging or we'll sound like we're trying to rub it in people's noses when the truth is, as a church, we should celebrate the wins. As much as we pray for the struggles, we need to celebrate the wins. We need to lift one, and one another up in the wins and encourage each other in that and celebrate those things because they're powerful and they matter. Not to rub one another's noses in it, but to say, look what God's done. Look what God's allowed us to have. Look what God's doing right now. This is amazing. Because if we don't do that, all we end up doing is talking about the things that are wrong. And that's all anybody ever sees is, man, all those Christian folk, all they ever do is talk about how they're sick and this is going wrong and this, that, and the other. I'm not saying we shouldn't. We need to pray for those things. We need to do those things. But as much as we do those, we need to do the other and show when God is offering blessings, show when God's taking care of us, give him the glory and rejoice in him. Because that matters too. When you have a success in your life, I want to know about it because I want to be excited with you. I want to encourage you. I want to rejoice with you. It's amazing. I love to see when God's moving and working and blessing lives. It's powerful. So we think about it. What do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Well, do everything without grumbling and complaint. Do it with a smile on your face. Something's uncomfortable, God's giving you the strength to make it through it. Something's difficult, God's going to walk through you with it. Put a smile on your face. Push hard. Get through it. And then rejoice in the strength he gives you to make it through. God's doing something great in your life? Great! Let us know so we can rejoice together, so we can encourage one another, so we can take strength in what God is doing and moving and working in your life. It's part of us being a family. Family not only comes together in the difficult times, we rejoice in the wins. We want to start counting some wins. And so church, I encourage you today, look for the wins. And let's start sharing them with one another, encouraging one another as we move forward, doing the things Christ has called us to do. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to continue to meet. God, we thank you for the truths you offer us. We thank you for the strength that only you can provide. And God, I pray for those that are hurting right now. Pray that you would give them strength. God, I pray for those that are celebrating wins. Thank you for the victories you provide. Pray that we would rejoice in those. As much as we come to you with the struggles, that we would rejoice and give you the glory and the wins. God, we thank you for the freedoms we celebrate daily through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, church, thank you for joining us again on this Wednesday. Obviously, we're still meeting digitally, and, and 
Hopefully sometime soon we'll come back together in person. Uh, but remember, we love you. There's nothing you can do about that. We encourage you. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, remember, like these videos. It helps get them out into the YouTube algorithm and spread these words out so other people can see them. Feel free to share these on your own Facebook pages or wherever. Reach out friends, family, whoever you think might be encouraged by it. Uh, please feel free to share these uh, out with anybody you feel so led to. With that in mind, remember, church, we're here for you. If you or anybody around you struggling, let us know. We are here to help. We want to help. And until we come together in person again, stay safe. We'll see you soon.